Hi, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Aidan Finn and tonight I'm going to be talking to you about Azure Virtual WAN and giving you an introduction to this game-changing networking technology from Microsoft Azure. Unfortunately, or kind of fortunately, it's actually a good news thing that I won't talk about now. I'm not going to be able to join you tonight. Um, something has happened. Uh, it's a good thing. And it means that I will have to be elsewhere tonight. So I'm pre-recording this session uh, early on Tuesday afternoon. And I really apologize for not being able to join you live and be able to deal with any questions and answers or scenario type questions that come up. But you can always find me on at Joe underscore LA on Twitter or as Aiden Finn on LinkedIn. Reach out, connect, and uh, you know I'll do my best to help you out there. So today I'm going to talk to you about Azure Virtual WAN. Uh, before I do that, just introduce myself. Uh, so I, as I said, I'm Aiden Finn. I am a Microsoft Azure MVP. Uh, previously, I've been a Hyper-V MVP and a, even a System Center Configuration MVP uh, or System Center Configuration Manager MVP for one year. I run my own company called Cloud Mechanics, where I develop and deliver my own Azure training. And during the day, I am a principal consultant for a company called Innofactor, a, a Scandinavian company. I work for the Oslo office in Norway, where I work with Azure infrastructure. So focusing on delivering um, secure, governed uh, landing zones delivered with DevOps and getting those services operational in an agile, scalable, and secure way. Um, I've been working in IT since 96, uh, so I've worked for large and small services companies. I've worked for large financial services companies and small businesses, you name it. And I've spent a good bit of my career working either as a sysadmin or as a consultant. Techs I've worked with include things like Windows Server and Hyper-V, System Center, and of course, Microsoft Azure. Um, I blog on aidenven.com. I work for Innofactor at innofactor.com. As I said, I have my own company called Cloud Mechanics, which you'll find at cloudmechanics.com. And you'll find me on Twitter as at Joe underscore Elway. And I also write for Petri.com every month about Microsoft Azure. So let's get into this and talk about how we traditionally connect to Azure. So normally what we do is we will build some sort of a, a network architecture in Microsoft Azure. Now a good approach is where you implement something called a hub and spoke architecture. And this is a scalable solution that allows you to deliver ORBAC and governance and security and reuse expensive resources such as a site-to-site -site network connection. Um, the hub replaces the concept of a network core that you would have in a computer room or a data center. It's a virtual network that's made up of subnets. It'll have some form of appliances in there. It'll have root tables to force flows through your firewalls and stuff like that. And there'll be connections. And those connections may be uh, virtual network peering out to your spokes where you're running your services in different uh, virtual networks. Um, it may be site-to-site -site VPN. It may be point-to-site VPN for end users, or it might be an express root circuit, giving you a low latency SLA supported connection uh, through a service provider from important locations um, or relaying as a backhaul from your branch offices through your uh, central locations. And if you have multiple Azure footprints, there will be a lot of complexity with this and a lot of costs. And I'll come back to that in a second. The world of the MPLS is changing. If you were a large enterprise um, or even a medium-sized organization, you, there's a good chance you have an MPLS for your one or some form of VPN uh, connectivity that's provided by a service provider. It's expensive. Um, and you may have locations that really don't require that class of service. What we're seeing now is the concept of an SD-WAN coming along and replacing some of these expensive connections and saying, right, we can put in resilient VPN connections. And although they are going across the internet and may not have the same SLA that an MPLS will provide, because you've got resilient connections, we can give you something better than an SLA, which is uptime, because uh, an SLA is just a contract that promises you refunds or discounts if there's an outage. It doesn't actually guarantee that there won't be an outage. You also get your cost down, and you can do things like class of service where you can send certain traffic across your low latency links and other types of traffic that don't require latency or low latency to go across your higher latency links, like Wi-Fi or something. Uh, 
This is all made possible using intelligent appliances from third-party hardware vendors. So your typical network vendors that are out there, they will put an appliance into each location, they will aggregate your bandwidth together. As I said, they can do this class of service type thing. And importantly, they're really easy to deploy. So they'll do self-configured routing. So the things will reach out to the rest of the network and figure out, okay, where am I? How do I get from A to B and then on to C? And they're really easy to deploy. Some of them are designed to work in pop-up deployments. Now, I said that scaling can be difficult and I've just talked about SD-WAN and the concept of it being simple. Let's contrast that with some of the complexities that we can have when we start talking about Microsoft Azure connecting several or many locations to your Azure deployments. Let's imagine we have Azure resources deployed across many regions and we need private network connectivity to those different Azure regions from our offices. We also have users who are roaming around the world. So maybe we've got users in North America, users in Africa, users in Asia, users in Europe. We want them to be able to not just connect to the local Azure region, but we want them to be able to connect to any service via their VPN connection. And maybe we want them to be able to route, not just to Azure, but also the branch offices. Well, typically what you're doing in that situation with those roaming users is you're trying to get them onto an on-prem network and then route through the on-prem network back up to the cloud, which seems a bit of a, a loop if you think about it. And we don't necessarily have the most intelligent ways of doing it. So maybe a user who is from America has traveled to Southeast Asia and is VPNing back to America to get onto some service running in East US or West US. So they're going making that long trip across the internet with their VPN tunnel, which is introducing a lot of latency, maybe 300 plus milliseconds. And their performance of their applications is gonna suck. So we have all this complexity and, that, and we haven't even talked about routing. So when we start popping in multiple Azure footprints and we start implementing firewalls in each of those footprints and trying to force flows through those firewalls, that routing becomes really, really complex. I know this stuff really well. Most people don't understand this stuff, don't understand the complexity with this stuff to make sure that the traffic is actually going through the firewall, not accidentally going through the firewall. As I said, user connectivity can be a challenge, not just for that roaming user, but also for the branch offices. How do I make sure that someone who's in London is able to connect to my services running in UK South, but also in East US? And maybe that London office is able to talk to people who are in West US as well. Um, you have the challenge with pop-up locations. So imagine construction, retail, or even military, where a facility is popped up. They need to be able to get that online and connecting to the cloud really quickly. Your traditional express route or site-to-site -site VPN solutions aren't really gonna work here. And then we've got the scale-out concept. So imagine a, a petrol station organization or a retail organization or a large enterprise that has many locations. A petrol station could have hundreds, if not thousands or tens of thousands of locations around the UK. Now imagine each of those locations trying to connect up to UK South. That's not gonna work so well, is it? With your traditional site to site VPN or your express route, because well, you're gonna hit your four or eight express route circuit connections straight away. Are you gonna backhaul everyone back uh, through one or two locations across the MPLS network. Sounds expensive, sounds slow. And we have a max of 30 site to site VPN connections in a traditional deployment. So this thing is not gonna scale. We need an alternative. And this is where that SD-WAN concept really comes into play. And that's where Microsoft Virtual WAN is aiming to, to meet your uh, needs. So Virtual WAN, is where we can implement a new virtual network hub in Azure instead of the traditional approach. Instead of me deploying all these different resources, so a virtual network with its subnets and the network security groups and root tables and firewall appliances and all the stuff that may go with third-party firewall appliances to make them highly available. Instead of doing all that mess, why don't I just tell Azure, you know what, I would like a hub please, and I would like to be able to connect to that hub. You just take care of all the stuff for me, right? And I'm gonna connect up uh, spoke virtual networks to you and you just handle the routing for me. Will you just do that for me, please? That's what my customers typically want is as much platform as possible. Push the complexity down the stack. Let me focus on the service. Let me focus on things like governance and security. You just handle the plumbing for me. 
And that's what Virtual WAN aims to do. So it pushes all that complexity down into the stack. In fact, it doesn't even execute in your tenant. It runs in a Microsoft tenant. It, it appears in your tenant, sort of. It's like the tip of the iceberg, and it builds in your tenant. But the complexity is hidden away. So simplifies that hub. But also, it's an implementation. It's a virtual implementation of an appliance for an SD-WAN. So now we can make Azure a part of your SD-WAN. So all those third-party appliances are going to connect to that hub. And now it's not just necessarily a part of your SD-WAN, but with some tech of the technologies that Microsoft have implemented and have uh, implemented with partners, that Azure Virtual WAN hub can now be the center of your WAN. So it really makes Azure a strategic location on your network. Now, you don't need to have an SD-WAN to use this. This is an important note. In fact, what, what Microsoft have seen during the pandemic is a lot of people are implementing Azure Virtual WAN, even if they don't have an SD-WAN, because some of the technologies in here and the routing functionality, and particularly the point-to-site VPN technology for, work for, uh, for working from home, has really changed the game. So it allows people who are working from home not just to connect to Azure, but also can, uh, be able to route back to on-premises as well with this scalable, instantly available, well, near instantly, it does take about an hour to deploy the resources, and most of that is waiting time. Um, this thing is just there and very easy to deploy, and, as, and the point-to-site VPN technology has driven adoption like crazy during the pandemic. So don't just think, oh, this is for SD-WAN people, people who bought Cisco, whatever, or Citrix or whatever. That is not the case. If you have a normal express route circuit or a normal site-to-site -site VPN with one of the Microsoft-supported uh, on-premises appliances, um, then you can do this as well. So what have we got in this virtual WAN? Well, the virtual WAN is a global resource. And we create one of these, and there's really nothing to it. It has a name, and it then gets associated with things called hubs, and we'll come back to that in a second. Um, everything is deployed as a, a, a sub-resource, basically, of the virtual WAN. This is kind of the tip of the iceberg. As I said, this is a global resource. So whether you're an organization who's only going to have one Azure footprint, or you're going to have many Azure footprints across many different regions, um, you will have one virtual WAN. And this becomes kind of the, the central GUI if you're using the Azure portal instead of uh, IAC. This becomes the central GUI for managing all the different resources within your environment. In each region you are going to uh, in, in Azure that you are going to use, you are going to deploy an Azure Virtual Hub. So if you were deploying into UK South and into West Europe, you would have two virtual hubs. And that's the, the, the main way of typically doing it. You could say, I'm going to have a virtual hub in UK South, and I'm going to have spokes in different regions around the world. Um, there may be some limitations based on your choice of express route. Uh, but realistically, there'll be some cost implications with that as well. So typically, what you're going to do is have one hub per region, and then have the spokes uh, aligned with that hub in that region as well. Um, it's a regional resource, and thanks to the current limitations of virtual or of, of virtual network peering, you can have a maximum of 500 spokes per region. So that's 500 virtual networks connecting back into that hub, and that's something that Microsoft realized is not going to work for the super large enterprises. So I think they've uh, you know, turned their attention back to that max VNet peering limit again. So we've seen it increase from 100 to 300 to 500. I would expect to see it go up into the thousands uh, with the next jump. Um, that virtual hub is going to have root tables. We'll come back to those later. It's going to have gateways and connections. And those connections, there's two types. They are connections that come in the form of virtual network peering to our spoke virtual networks where we're going to deploy our services in the cloud. And we can have connections to our on-premises sites in the form of site-to-site -site VPN, point-to-site -site VPN, and express route. There are five pillars of Azure Virtual WAN. So if you see uh, some of the program managers from the Azure Virtual WAN team, they typically build a presentation around these five pillars. And I'm going to do the same as well. So the first one is connectivity. 
And that's the primary thing of Azure Virtual WAN, is to connect people and services and locations in a seamless way if possible with any-to-any -any connectivity. So the first type of connectivity we have, and the one you typically are going to see in a large SD-WAN implementation, is site-to-site -site VPN. So it supports both IKE v1 and IKE v2. Um, you'll often see people saying, oh, it only supports IKE v2. It actually supports both. So IKE v2 is useful for our policy-based connections. But if you have you know, legacy appliances that only support policy-based VPN, then they can be implemented here as well. There's a big range of partners if you are using SD-WAN appliances. Um, so if you do want to implement a true SD-WAN appliance or SD-WAN, uh, driven by third-party appliances that will automatically lift some of the heavy work off of your shoulders. Do a search uh, online. You'll quickly see there's something like 15 different vendors out there, typical names that you would expect to see. So you will see, for example, Cisco Meraki. You will find uh, Citrix, uh, Brocade, Barracuda, etc. And HP uh, also own one or recently acquired one of the vendors that's on that supported list. With this type of connectivity, we can have up to 1,000 branches. So that's locations, whether it's at your headquarters or whatever. Branch is a generic term uh, referring to someone who's connecting or some place that is connecting in via one of these connectivity solutions. We can have up to 1,000 branches per hub. So if I have a hub deployed in the UK South, I can have up to 1,000 site-to-site VPN supported branches connecting to that hub in UK South. Each one with two active active tunnels, if I wish. That's some scalability and high availability right there. Uh, that site-to-site -site VPN gateway supports up to 20 gigabits per second of aggregate throughput. And that is uh, determined by how you size and scale that VPN gateway. So you'll pick how many scale units that site to site VPN uh, gateway will have in that hub. And that will determine how much throughput that gateway can have and what your billing will be for that gateway as well. Now, there's some recently announced features here. So IPsec uh, will now support FQDN. And they are also allowing custom BGP in a PIPA. Um, this is to support third-party clouds, <coughs> AWS. Um, so now we can do really interesting SD-WANs. Don't just include Azure and on-prem, but also use third-party clouds as well. As I said, um, there's a partner-driven solution here. Um, so if you wish, you can deploy physical appliances on-prem. But a recent innovation that's being done is to uh, allow the hub to support virtual appliances. Um, so we can implement virtual appliances in third-party clouds, but we can also implement uh, virtual appliances in a new preview program for the uh, virtual hub inside the hub itself. With these third-party appliances running on-prem, these physical appliances, it really supports that pop-up office or retail location uh, concept. So I can pop up a new office really quickly, like a construction site, put in my prefabs, etc. send out an appliance with some wiring instructions. People just pop in the right wires in the right place, maybe color code the whole thing. And then as soon as they power up the thing, it reaches out, gets instructions, and that pop-up location is now on the SD-WAN and able to connect to the other locations in the SD-WAN, whether they are Azure or other physical locations or even point-site users. Um, and this is automatically going to configure things like routing, encryption, which is the best uh, path to select for different types of connections or traffic, etc. And other third-party things that uh, may be implemented in there as well. One of the real cool things about this is it simplifies that configuration process. So you think about, for those of you who have supported, whether you're a consultant or a sysadmin, a, a branch admin or a customer in setting up a site-to-site -site VPN and they get all sorts of little things wrong, um, like timeouts or configurations or packet sites or whatever it is, um, this really just nailed all that stuff and it's, it's an automated deployment. So think about if you're a, a traditional admin who's done lots of things, um, think about, um, how different it is to give someone an image to deploy uh, Windows on their PC versus giving someone a DVD and saying install Windows with your software on it. It's a big difference. And that's really what they're trying to do here with the, the branch office in the SD-WAN.
Another form of connectivity we can have is express route. The, the big perk of express route or perks of, S, of express route are um, low latency, the ability to have very high levels of bandwidth, plus it's also supported with an SLA. Um, so your circuit is implemented with dual cables, ideally over uh, redundant uh, routers and network edge appliances, and guarantees you a low level of latency between your physical location and Microsoft Azure and other locations in the Microsoft clouds across the Microsoft WAN. Um, again, this is implemented with a gateway that's scaled out using scale units and those scale units determine your billing and the total aggregate throughput up to 20 gigabits per second. And new, um, recently announced at Ignite, is that each region will now support up to eight circuits connecting into that hub's express route gateway. Now, historically, you may have heard that we needed the premium SKU of Express Route to connect to Azure Virtual WAN. And that was a bit of a downer because the premium SKU is expensive. And the reason that was required was to support global reach. So we could have that any to any connectivity that I'll talk about in a few minutes um, between my location that has this circuit connected and other locations um, around the Microsoft uh, Azure Virtual WAN. Um, some Azure regions do not support global reach. So in order for these locations or Azure regions to be able to support Azure Virtual WAN, Microsoft has opened up things a little bit. So now we can deploy Express Route Standard into these regions, but the catch is we have to disable uh, the any-to-any -any connectivity for branch-to-branch -branch transit, because that's a feature of the premium SKU of Express Route. If you wish to use a lower end SKU, you can use Express Route Local, but now we have to make sure that we have disabled that branch to branch transit as well. But we have also made sure that all the spokes connected to my hub are in the same region as the hub. Um, so you need to watch out for that. Uh, branch to branch transit is also disabled for VPN as well. So. Now let's talk about point to site VPN. And this is the one that's really driven the adoption of S uh, Azure Virtual WAN over the last six to nine months. Um, so it's Ike V2, it supports the Azure uh, VPN client and it supports open VPN clients. It supports cert-based authentication and radius-based authentication. One of the cool features we get with the Azure client is the profile management. Um, so we get traffic management so we can say, you know what, I'm a roaming user and I'm normally in the US, but I'm gonna travel over to Southeast Asia. I'm gonna have the Azure client with the global profile, which will allow me to connect to the closest Azure virtual WAN hub. So now I get onto the Microsoft WAN at the closest point and I can route to whatever service I'm using. So if I am trying to get from somewhere in Malaysia and I VPN up to maybe a hub in Southeast Asia, and I'm trying to talk to some server that's running in my office in London, I will route across the Microsoft WAN, giving a low latency connection back to Europe and maybe to where I have a hub running in UK South and then across my express route and my VPN connection from UK South back to my office, uh, maybe in Newcastle or whatever it is. Um, this also now supports custom DNS as well. Uh, again, the gateway is a, it's a point to site VPN gateway that's part of the hub. It's another sub resource within the hub. Um, it's based on scale units. Um, so we size the gateway based on scale units that determines the total aggregate throughput. Again, 20 gigabits per second maximum and uh, the billing cost as well. And this supports up to 10,000 users per hub. So that's pretty good improvement over the old days of 128 max users for a VPN gateway in an Azure virtual network. Now I mentioned earlier um, that partners are really at the heart of SD-WAN and Microsoft are really implementing that. So today, if you're implementing a generally available Azure virtual WAN hub, you're gonna be using one of those Microsoft Virtual Network Gateways, you're gonna be using an Azure Firewall if you wish to enable a firewall in that implementation in the hub, though you can enable third-party firewalls in a spoke and route via that spoke to get to different locations. 
but uh, the Azure Virtual WAN team are very partner centric and have been working very closely with network partners. So what they've been doing is in a private or in a public and private preview program, they've been uh, implementing third party uh, SD-WAN appliances instead of Microsoft Virtual Network Gateways in the Azure Virtual WAN hub. This basically means that, yeah, the, you know, the virtual network gateway will probably do a lot of people, but some people want to have additional features that Microsoft don't implement, but are implemented in the physical on-prem appliances or might be used in virtual appliances and other clouds. So, so far, Microsoft have announced uh, Barracuda SD-WAN and Cisco Viptela SD-WAN, but there are other partners that they are talking with at the moment, and they are openly inviting partners to reach out to the Azure Virtual WAN team and get involved in this program, because they really want to be, you know, all things to all people. So no matter what you want, they want to be able to deliver that to those customers. The primary thing that drove Azure Virtual WAN was to make it a global transit architecture. It's, it's what they said at uh, Ignite recently is why they started off this whole thing. Um, so the idea with um, your SD-WAN is to enable any to any connectivity, uh, subject to firewall rules, of course. So we should be able to have transit connectivity between branches and Azure, between branches and branches, users and branches, virtual networks and other virtual networks, even if they're in different regions, and between VPN and express route, all through the SD-WAN. So this can route through our virtual WAN hubs and then back out again if we don't have direct paths between different locations and users. So the concept is we're always routing through a hub in this implementation if there isn't a direct connection. So we can see branch to Azure, going through our hubs, branch to branch, again through our hubs, and taking advantage of that virtual WAN. So if I have a location in UK South and a location in New York, I can transit through UK South, across the Microsoft WAN, across the Atlantic in a low latency way, and then exit East US and then out to in my New York office, minimizing that latency and doing it at a lower cost than I would have implemented an MPLS network. Users, again, can connect in. So my roaming user or my work from home user can connect up to the local hub and then route to, in theory, any branch location in my WAN subject to firewall rules. My virtual networks in different Azure regions or even the same Azure regions can route to each, to each other, whether it's through the hub or through hubs and the Microsoft WAN. And we have transit between VPN and Express Route. So I can have my pop-up location on a construction site or a military base, connect up to my virtual WAN in a lo to, via the local Azure region, and then route through the Microsoft WAN to get to my physical locations that are connected via express route. All of this is made possible through routing. And if you've done hub and spoke, or if you've looked at hub and spoke networking in Microsoft Azure, you know that to make it work, you need to have some form of routing appliance in every hub. So what we get in the Azure Virtual WAN hub is a hidden platform router. It's there, it's implicit. You don't, you don't see it, it is just there and we can manipulate it. And I'll show you that in a few moments. This router supports up to 50 gigabits um, of throughput um, per second. Um, so that's quite a bit of throughput. It actually exceeds what the Azure Firewall can support. Um, so if we implement uh, one of these virtual hubs with the Azure Firewall, um, the Firewall is going to bring its limitation of 30 gigabits per second without a support call. I, and you can get that up to 40 gigabits per second with a support call. And that's assuming your traffic is going through that firewall. The more than likely it probably is at that point if you're implementing a firewall. And um, this will control routes between all the gateways and all your spokes. So all your gateways being your branches or your on-premises and your remote users. And they are coming in through your gateways across your site site VPN, your express route and your point site VPN. It also provides us with our VNet to VNet transit in that hub and spoke architecture. We can manipulate the routing uh, provided by the hub using route tables. Now this is where things get a little different to your traditional hub and spoke architecture. If you've been implementing a hub and spoke architecture 
and you've implemented a firewall, even if you haven't implemented a hub and spoke architecture, if you've implemented a firewall to make sure the traffic is flowing through that firewall, inbound and outbound, you have had to implement root tables and do user-defined routing and being able to optimize and manipulate and override your BGP and your system routes. In the Azure Virtual WAN, they took a lot of feedback early on in their engineering to understand the complexities with uh, user-defined routing, uh, controlling BGP and um, system routing to make sure that flows through the firewall weren't accidental, they were deliberate. Um, and they have implemented a new form of routing where instead of doing routing at the edge, um, where we normally would do it on our gateway subnet and each of our spoke subnets, instead we're implementing the routing in the hub, which then gets pushed out to the rest of the network. And in the hub, in each region, you will have three types of root tables. Two of them are always there, the default root table and the non root table. And we will go through these. And we also have the ability to create what are called custom root tables. The default root table, it sits there and its job is basically to provide routing by default. And typically we will use this with branches. Now remember branches include physical locations, so your headquarters, your hub offices, your branch offices, your retail locations, your pop-up offices, and your point-to-site users. So the people who are opening up a VPN client on their Mac, their PC, or whatever it is, and VPNing into the SD-WAN, they are all referred to as branches. And typically, we will use the default root table to control the flows coming in and force that to a firewall appliance, whether it's an Azure firewall running in the hub, a third-party firewall that may eventually appear in the hub, or a third-party firewall that's running in a spoke virtual network. We also have the non-root table. Now, this is a funny name. Um, Personally, I would have called it something else, uh, maybe the black hole um, root table. And the purpose of the non-root table is to basically drop packets. When you say that I have a, a, a destination prefix and I would like packets to, that are trying to get to that prefix just to be dropped, you will add that prefix to your non-root table. And that sounds a bit weird, but you know what? I actually use that sort of technology where I have certain things that have no business talking to on-premises, for example, or to certain services. And I want to make sure I'm not just implementing that with the firewall, I'm also implementing that in the root table as well. So it doesn't even get to the firewall in the first place. Um, so we can drop that traffic deliberately if necessary. The real magic with Azure Virtual WAN comes with custom routing. And this has been generally available. It had a quiet uh, GA in September. And this is a concept where we can build up root tables inside the, uh, the virtual hub in each region. And we can configure flows uh, from our spoke uh, virtual network subnets. And we can control the flows in uh, using this central deployment instead of deploying user-defined routes with root tables that are then associated with every subnet. So there's some terminology that goes with this, and I've already talked about branches, um, but let's talk about connections. Connections are the things that connect our branches, so our point to site, site to site, and express route, with the hub, but also connect our spoke virtual networks with the hub. So that branches includes our point to site VPN, site to site VPN, express route, and our VNet connections is basically the peering connection that's created between those spoke virtual networks and the hub. We then have an association. So when we associate a root table, we will associate it with that connection. And that means that the, the routes that are in uh, that root table will be propagated out to the virtual network associated with that association. A configuration for a root table includes propagation. And this is where we can say we want to propagate routes from our connected networks into the root table. So now we have a jumble of things going on here. We have our connections. So we have our virtual networks and our locations connecting to our hub. We can associate a root table with one of those connections, which basically says, hey, anything in my root table, I'm going to send out to you via your connection. 
And then we can configure propagation to say, hey, I want you, virtual network, I want you to propagate your network address spaces into this root table. So anyone who's associate, associated with this root, root table will get your roots. But the real magic will come in form of static roots. If you're implementing firewalls, this is the one you're going to be interested in. Static roots is where we will say, you know what, if you're trying to get to somewhere, from somewhere, you're going to go via this firewall, whether it's the firewall running in my virtual hub or it's a firewall running in a spoke of a third party appliance. So let's have a quick look as a bit of a hokey scenario, but it's a scenario that gives you an idea of what's going on. So here we have a hub that's been implemented and it's what we refer to as a secure virtual hub. So that means it has an Azure firewall implemented inside of that hub. We have some branches and um, we've got a couple of offices, but this could also include uh, point to site VPN as well. And we've got some spokes in our Azure footprint. So this particular region, we've got uh, three different spoke virtual networks that are peered to that hub. So they have connections to that hub. What we want here is all traffic coming in from our branches, so our physical locations, pop-up locations, whatever they are, and our point-to-site VPN users, any connections coming in through the gateways in that virtual hub, we want to force those through the firewall if they want to get to any of our spokes. Any traffic that's trying to get from the spokes to the rest of the world, so basically the branches or the internet, will have to go through our firewall. And we're going to allow traffic from the spokes to get to each other um, without having to go through the firewall. And um, so we're actually going to have to implement some extra steps to make that one possible. So first thing we're going to do is look at the branches. What we'll do is we will create a default root table. Um, actually, apologies, apologies there. We're going to use the default root table that exists in the hub. And in there, we're going to create a static path that says, hey, if you want to get to the aggregate, aggregated network address space of our spokes, you have to go through the Azure Firewall. So if you were to look at the, the ARM template for this, you would actually see a reference to the resource ID of the Azure Firewall that's running inside of that virtual hub. Then in the configuration for that root table, we're going to say it's going to be associated with our branches. So that's a simple configuration. It's just going to be the default root table. It's going to be associated with our branches. And we are going to propagate that to our branches as well. So simple enough configuration. Now we have a look at what we're doing with the spokes. Again, we're going to, we're going to create a custom root table here. I'm going to call this VNet dash root table. And in here, we are going to create a static root saying if you want to go to quad zero, so 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0 slash zero, you're going to go to the resource ID of the Azure firewall. So if you want to get to the branches, if you want to get to the internet, you're going to go through that firewall, whether you like it or not. Then we're going to associate that root table with our connections for those virtual networks. So that now means the routes that are in that root table are going to propagate out to those virtual networks. And then we're going to configure propagation. We're going to say, hey, virtual networks, we want you to propagate your routes into that root table. So this is the real magic now where we're bypassing the firewall to do spoke to spoke traffic. So a route for each virtual network or spoke will automatically propagate into the root table and therefore out to the virtual networks that are associated with the root table. So now spoke 2-vnet knows about spoke 1 and spoke 3 and knows all it has to do is go via the hub to get there. And we put the whole thing together and we've met our requirements. Branches need to go through the firewall to get to the spokes. Spokes need to go through the firewall to get to the internet and to the branches. And spokes can route through the hub without going through the firewall to get to each other. Now, if I wanted to force spoke to spoke traffic through the firewall, I actually wouldn't have done that propagation step at all. I would have just said, yeah, just use my static route. Now, I've talked about the secure virtual hub, and the concept is that we deploy an Azure firewall into our Azure virtual WAN hub. 
Um, it's a new SKU of the Azure Firewall. Uh, it's the same price as the Azure Firewall, and it's using the same virtual hub. Um, so the pricing regarding your virtual hubs will be the same as well. Firewall, if you've used Azure Firewall before, management will be a little different. You will have to use Azure Firewall Manager, which means you're implementing your firewall configurations and your rules using the policy. Though you may have noticed um, some new features recently over the summer that only appeared in Azure Firewall policy and didn't uh, appear in the Azure Firewall itself. I think if we look back to what happened with the Azure Application Gateway and its web application firewall configuration, we can see the writings on the wall there. Um, Azure Firewall policy is the place uh, to start putting your time and effort if you are using Azure Firewall. Um, this will require that you do some routing configuration. So it's back to that custom routing stuff that I talked about. But you might know some interesting stuff in there. Um, there's some third-party implementations we can do. So we get third-party support from the likes of Zscaler, iBoss, CloudGuard, um, where we can start saying, you know what, we want to browse the internet and force our traffic from our branches and point the site through the virtual hub in our SD-WAN, and then go out through these third-party solutions that are implemented through the Azure Firewall policy. Um, so we can start doing web filtering, any malware scanning, all that good stuff that these third parties can add. So this is, again, the Azure Virtual WAN team going, you know what, we can't do everything. And you know what, sometimes our partners do things better than we do or offer more features or even do things that we just don't do at all. So let's leverage them and work with them to give partners and customers a better offering than they would get without the, uh, these partners. Um, if you are implementing a multi-region SD-WAN implementation and you are trying to uh, route traffic from one spoke in one region to another spoke in another region and you've got a hub in each of those regions like you see in this picture, you should be aware that your custom routing is going to force traffic through one firewall. It's not going to go through both firewalls, and that's a limitation today. It's something that the virtual WAN team have heard feedback on. They want um, Some customers are saying that they want uh, both of these firewalls to actually be in control of the flows. Um, I see that point, absolutely, but the way I view Azure Firewall policy is I would implement um, Azure Firewall policy in a parent-child architecture where the parent one actually controls my inter-region uh, communications. And then the local stuff is controlled using a child policy only. But it really comes down to how your organization manages your firewalls and how it does your policies and stuff like that. Um, and some organizations really do want to see these flows going through two different firewalls. Uh, so one through the source firewall and then back, uh, to the destination through the destination firewall. And as I said, there are third party offerings as well. Um, so we can filter traffic uh, through third party SaaS offerings. So if you want to do VNet to internet, branch to internet uh, security stuff, you can do that um, using these third party offerings. And bear in mind that traffic for Microsoft 365 is intended to go straight to Microsoft 365. So from your branches, whether they're locations or users, that traffic should be going straight to M365, not through these third-party solutions. And finally, we get to monitoring. Um, it's great having this stuff and setting this stuff up, but realistically, you need to be able to manage this. So you are going to have your usual diagnostic settings. They're there for things like your firewall, your gateways, etc. cetera. Um, new preview feature is Virtual WAN Insights, which gives you a graphical view of what's going on. So you can uh, quickly see the architecture of your environment, the dependencies of your environment, but also start looking at some of the performance metrics as you browse around uh, the visual hierarchy. Um, but I wouldn't just take for granted that this stuff is working you shouldn't ever do that with any service or any system you should always configure your diagnostic settings in azure send your data to azure monitor logs or log analytics if we use the technical term and not the marketing term and then be creative build work uh, workbooks build dashboards create alerts look for things and when you learn about the environment and learn about bad things that can happen create those alerts create those visualizations to look for those things then look at Network Watcher. Um, use a Network Watcher extension and put it on your critical virtual machines in your environment so you can start doing things like uh, connection testing and Wireshark captures and stuff like that. 
Now, while we're talking about extensions, let's talk about Azure Connection Monitor. We can deploy log analytics extensions to on-premises, not just our Azure VMs, but we should do it with our Azure VMs, but also to a couple of select on-prem machines that got to be running 24-7. And then we can create tests that validate that we do have regular end-to-end -end connectivity and we have good performance, so expected low latency um, between those different uh, endpoints. And then if we exceed our latent, expected latency requirements or if we're not getting those end-to-end -end connections, we can create alerts and start knowing more about this environment. Of course, you're sending this data into log analytics so this is also a good opportunity to start hooking in uh, azure sentinel so uh, your security information and event management solution from microsoft and start correlating that data with the other security signals that are coming around from your environment and your entities and being able to uh, hunt for threats and create incidents uh, based on uh, different searches of the log analytics workspace as well so that's been a whistle stop tour of azure virtual wan I really hope that it's been useful to you. Again, I apologize for not being there. Um, if you do have questions um, that someone hasn't been able to answer in the community, please reach out to me and I'll do my best. And uh, I hope you have had a good evening. Uh, I know there's been some interesting content. Um, so thanks again, and hopefully I will see you soon.